this computer. So this is the talk that uh, everybody's been waiting for for a month or two or so. Maybe. Two months, more than two months now. <laughs> Consistently delayed. Yeah. It's the second part of Bruno's talk. And we're going to talk about covariant phase space formalism. Well, he's going to talk about it. All we're all going to talk about it. There are, there are experts in this meeting that know much more about gauge theories than I do. So there's probably going to be a, a nice interaction there. Uh, OK, so. As Eduardo was saying, this is the second talk on a series of two lectures that I had planned to finish over two months ago, but for various reasons only came to happen just now. And the goal today is to explore a little bit more about uh, co the covariant phase space formalism now in the case of gauge theories in particular. I'm going to spend most of the time talking. So the outline of the talk is roughly the following. So before jumping into any of these subjects, I'm going to just make a quick review of the main points that we discussed in the first lecture, just to, to freshen up our memories. Uh, then I'm going to say a few words about diffeomorphism charges and another theorem from the covariant phase space point, point of view. So uh, uh, canonical formulation of another theorem is formalism. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what is a gauge theory from the perspective of uh, canonical formulation in phase space. I'm going to say some general facts about what happens, and I'm going to give the example of electromagnetism and uh, and gravity as well, in, in the sense of a gauge theory. Now, this is a list of some useful references that talk about some of the short subjects that I'll be discussing here. This first reference is a very recent one from 2019, I think, about covariant phase space with boundaries. And the reason that's going to be relevant will show up uh, in a few minutes. These two here, by comparing Fyodor and Walden Zupas, are referenced more from the GR side. So the canonical formulation of surface charges in general relativity and other diffeomorphism invariant theories. And this last one is a set of lecture notes by Andrew Strominger on the infrared structure of gauge theories and gravity which is also going to be relevant for reasons that will become clear as we move along. So well, I, I just wanted to say one bit of thing. That first reference, right? The boundary is not null, right? No, no, no. That's yeah. That's, so, that, that's, uh, yeah that's, uh, uh, so last month, some, some groups wrote the case for the null boundary. So you can take a look at that one. OK, who were the, the ones? Because I know that I, Anthony I, was I, yeah, writing something about I, it. I forgot yeah. what's the group. Uh, what's the group or where they come from? But you just Google covariant space phase null boundary. And that's the exact title it is. Okay, yeah. Because Harlow and Wu were interested in ADS boundary conditions in that case. So they were assuming a time like boundary instead of. Yeah, this one they use null boundary. Uh, yeah, there's a new result on null boundaries. I don't know what it comes out with. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so. Before we jump into the main subjects, let's just review a quick uh, this, the, the concepts that we used last time. So I'm going to be systematically using the technology of differential, differential geometry and differential forms. Uh, so we recall that, uh, that a differential form is a completely anti-symmetric tensor with all indices down. And in the space of differential forms, we can define a notion of derivative given by the exterior derivative whose expression components is given by this. I hope this is familiar to, to everyone by now. Uh, now you can also define a vector field on a given manifold and an operation between vector fields and differential forms given by the interior products, which is just the contraction of the vector field with the first index of the differential form. And uh, you can also define a different notion of derivation given a vector field that's the derivation along the integral curves of this vector field that gives the lead derivative. And when acting on differential forms, uh, the lead derivative is related to the exterior derivative and the interior products by Cartan's metric formula. I'm, I'm being a bit quick here, but we all discussed this last time. So I think if you already saw this, this would be, would be helpful. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask again because I had the first time. And I I, I kind of object to the word magic there. That's, yeah. We already talked about it. <laughs> I'm not the one who, who gave the name to the form. So <laughs> uh, yeah, you can Google a lot of places, and it turns out that the word magic means different things to different people. Some people do find this magical. Yeah. <laughs> so Stack Exchange has this discussion, actually. So you can find it. Yeah. Uh, so 
in, in particular, if you have a manifold with a, with a metric, you can define a volume form that's, uh, that's given in coordinates by this expression. And given a volume form, we can define this other operator, which uh, this other operation, which I didn't mention at the first time, but I'm bringing it up now because this will simplify some of the, the equations. The, that's the Hodge dual of a P form. That's essentially the contraction of the P form with the volume form. But given uh, if you have a P form in a d-dimensional manifold, this operation returns a d minus P form. Those components are given by the equation below. Where the component, uh, where again I emphasize that the components of the volume form are simply given by the completely anti-symmetric symbol multiplied by the determinant of by the square root of the of the modulus of the determinant of the matrix. Uh, so last time we saw like the main punchline was how to construct a phase space of Lagrangian field theory without explicitly breaking covariance, right? So the first step was to remove the attention from initial conditions on a given Cauchy surface on a given instant of time, because the notion of an instant of time in general curved space times is ambiguous and choosing it will explicitly break covariance. And instead we define phase space uh, by defining points of phase space as solutions to the equations of motion, that if the initial value problem is well-defined, are in one by one-to-one -one correspondence to initial data on an equation surface. Uh, and, and then we introduced this other structure on phase space, that's the pre-simplexic form, and we showed how we can covariantly, dis covariantly build from the Lagrangian uh, the so-called prism platform, which is also a fundamental ingredient on conceptualizing phase space. Uh, just to recall how it, how it all works, the idea is that you take the Lagrangian that defines your theory, you vary it with respect to the dynamical fields. By integration by part style manipulations, you're always going to be able to write this in, as a term that's linear on the variations of the dynamical fields that gives, as we discussed last time, the equation of motion and a total derivative, that's a boundary term that doesn't contribute to the equation of motion. But it turns out that the important part to define the symplastic form comes precisely from this boundary term that we call the pre-symplastic potential. The reason why we call it a potential is because we will define the pre-symplastic currents as the exterior derivative of this pre-symplastic potential on phase space. So we also discussed there the, this, nota this notation that emphasizes the difference between exterior derivatives on space-time and exterior derivatives on phase space. This is an exterior derivative on phase space that does give uh, that does gives a symplastic form, a pre-symplastic current. Sorry, that's a two-form on phase space and a d minus one form on space-time. And thus, by integrating that on the Cauchy surface, you get a scalar on phase time that's a, a d minus one for, a two form on, on phase space. That's what we call the presymplectic form. And we also showed that by construction, this presymplectic form here is closed on phase space because it's the delta of something. And uh, perhaps less trivial fact it is it's that it is also independent on which Cauchy surface you pick when evaluated on solutions to the equations of motion. Because of the fact that when the equations of motion hold, the presymplastic currents is closed. Right? So this has all been discussed last time. So I just wanted to recall what were the main steps here so that we could move on. Do, does anybody have any, any questions there? Okay, so now, given uh, a space-time diffeomorphism that's infinitesimally generated by some vector field psi, uh, we also discussed there that you can define uh, some notion of vector field on configuration space, that is on the field configurations on space-time, by simply writing an equation like this. Right? This is supposed to be a generalization of the usual form of a vector field in terms of partial derivatives, but now partial derivatives being replaced with Functional derivatives. And we discuss this difference between what, is, what we call uh, the lead derivative on phase space versus the derivative on space time. So, whereas the lead derivative 
on phase space is defined essentially through this equation and thus only involves variations of the dynamical fields. The lead derivative on space time will act on whatever tensor you got from the expression of the tensor. So in particular, when you have some non-trivial backgrounds, for example, the theory of the scalar field in space time with the metric, where the metric is a background that's fixed, uh, this requirement that we said for a uh, tensor to be covariant in a diffeomorphism psi is a non-trivial one. So we give an example there in the case of the scalar field to see how, how this all matches. And now what is interesting about this notion is that if you have a Lagrangian deform that's covariant under the action of a diffeomorphism psi, you can show that the action, that the variation of the action induced by this diffeomorphism is a pure boundary term, right? So in particular, this means that the easiest way to see this is from Hamilton's principle to minimize the action. This diffeomorphism will then take old solutions to the equation of motion that extremize an old action to new solutions that also extremize an action because the difference now is only good in the boundary term. And so this vector field that we defined in, in the previous slide constitutes a legitimate phase space vector field because now we, you, make, you can make sure that it, that it takes old solutions to the equation of motion, that is old points on phase space, to all other points on phase space. So it's really a vector field that's tangent to, to phase space as we defined it. Uh, yeah, Bruno, I, this is yeah. the part where I don't understand when I read it. So uh, is the covariance requirement is saying that the symmetry of the Lagrangian should be also the symmetry of the solutions? Yeah, that, that's a that, that's a consequence, right? I mean, the that's a that, there is also less trivial way to to prove this in the sense that you can look at it explicitly from the point of view of the equation of motion. So the, the idea is, what do you mean by symmetry, right? Yeah. What what physicists usually say when when they're talking about symmetries is a uh, change in the configuration that remains. Uh, that leaves something invariant. In this case, it's the action. And the reason why we believe this is a reasonable requirement is that the, if you take the old equations of motion and you apply this change on the dynamical fields, you get a new equation. Of, you get a new solution to the equation. Of motion. Mm -hmm. right? So that's what I meant when I said this. Is that, does that answer your question? Well, almost. What I, I guess to put it simple, let's take the example of the Lagrangian, right? Mm -hmm. So physically, what what does saying that the the Lie derivative of the phase space vector field is the same as the vector field, uh, the, the symmetry result? Because, for example, if C is a killing vector, right? Yeah. Then, then, the log, uh, then we are just saying that L is invariant under that particular space time symmetries, right? Yeah. But what uh, if I climb so up that means, So that means that, if it, that, that means in particular that if I take a solution to the equation of motion and translate that according to the, the the vector field, that's a killing vector, I will get yeah. a, a, another solution to the equation of motion. That's yeah, generally exactly. not true. So for example, if I take a, if I take the example of a point particle, a free particle, for instance, mm -hmm. and I translate that in space, that will be uh, a new solution, a new legitimate solution to the equation of motion. But if I make some more, more complicated function of time to change that solution, I'm not going to get a new solution. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I see, I see. So yeah. basically it relates the symmetry of the solutions to the thing, even though it's a consequence, I guess. You demand yeah. this first and then you get that as, as your answer. Yeah, so, so maybe the non-trivial thing here is that the, the only requirement that you need in order for a symmetry to be a symmetry of the solution is for it to be a symmetry of the action in this sense. So that the recognition yeah, yeah, yeah. is a... Yeah, bye. So this is this is uh, this is a uh, definitely not It's a generalization in a way, or abstra abstraction, if you want, abstraction of the way in which we build physical theories out of postulates and write mathematical in, in, in mechanics. Uh, in these cases, this is putting a restriction on what is physical, physically available. Yeah. Like no, no, no. I mean, come on. We need those. Th our, my physical theory needs to have these symmetries from first principles, and that's how I build my action. So by construction, yeah. I build. In a way, I mean, this is not really the action, but by construction, you're imposing those symmetries in your theory. You're kind of discarding everything that breaks this kind of covariance. Yeah. That cannot exist. So that's, so that's the way that Landau starts his book on mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Everybody talks, yeah. 
<laughs> let's so he prescribes a Lagrangian that displays uh, translational translational invariance and it starts from there. Right. The, the, the rest of so yeah, that's that's a that's a, an abstract way of seeing exactly the. Mm -hmm. So, is there so is there any yeah, sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna ask: Is there any simple way of seeing that if this is equivalent to asking that the that the that the coefficients of x i are uh, solutions to the linearized equations of motion? I, I know there is a way to see this. I don't know if that's simple. I I, I can say that in words, but I know you can check that. And for me, either and. Because essentially th that is what it means for the vector field to be tangent to phase space, right? Yeah, to that's why it's variations to, to be a solution to the linearized equation. Okay. But yeah, you can show that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we discussed what is what we're going to be meaning by a symmetry of the Lagrangian, that's a symmetry of the phase space of the theory. And one thing that it, it's particularly easy to show is that this will lead to some notion of conserved currents, right? So the, the way we do this is we also had a different definition or a different way to compute this variation of the Lagrangian, where now we replace the, those variations on the fields by the derivatives according to this, like, to this different morphism, right? So now by using these two facts, by using this equation up here and the equation that holds when the Lagrangian is covariant in this different morphism, we, sh we see directly that when the equation of motion holds, there is a JXI that is closed, right? Where the, the expression, the explicit expression for this JXI is given here, right? That's easy to see by just equating this with this, with the equation 13, and killing the term that's proportional to the equation of motion. And this in turn implies that under some suitable conditions on the boundaries that make the, the, the quantities finite and preserve the boundary conditions that define the theory, one, def one can get a conserved charge associated to this different morphism that's given explicitly by the integral of this current on any Cauchy surface of your spacetime. Of course, the fact that this is independent of Cauchy surface is a consequence of the fact that the, the integral in this J is closed. Right? Not only that, but there's also a less trivial fact that you can that you can see that this conserved charge that I just that I just computed generates the action of this space-time symmetry on the phase space of the theory by contraction with the prism platform. form. Uh, so this is a computation that's not that hard to, to follow. It basically, just use Cartan's magic formula on both phase space and space-time. As well as the equations of motion and the, Sorry, Bruno, why did you say this is less trivial? Because this is the, the generalization of Hamilton's equation. Yeah, I mean, at least for me, it could sound not trivial that for, on the one hand you have a, a charge, right. and on the other hand, that 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 you that you created from a symmetry. And on the other hand, it's always gonna be true that the symmetry is generated by that same charge by by contracting the person platform. I know that it is indeed equivalent to, right. to Hamilton's equation of motion, and that's exactly what I wrote. Ah, okay. <laughs> follow up. But so you, you know, I could understand that. Trivial. The result is expected. Like seeing yeah. a priori anticipated and they would be like that is, uh, is what you say is non trivial or, or what? I mean, I think it depends. Being non trivial or not depends on how much you already know about Hamiltonian mechanics, I guess. Okay. I mean, if because you know. If you know Phase-based formulation of mechanics, right? This is not surprising. Yeah. This is what you should have. Yeah. The, yeah. the analog, the, the generalization of the Hamiltonian flows. So of course, you're going to have Hamilton's equation here, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. just to so be, it's good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I was just saying that. Uh, just to be sure, those Hamiltonian vector field stuff is typically not an undergrad stuff, right? Except maybe no. what you are teaching, right? So right. I, I won't say that this is something that uh, is obvious. To most no. people. But from the previous lecture, maybe, because we brought Hamilton's equation coordinate yeah, independent yeah. in the previous lecture, no, Bruno? I yeah, yeah, I yeah, yeah, we did. And Ericsson read the, the slides, so. Maybe. No, you're I right. I mean, it's, not, it's yeah. not trivial as in undergrad. Oh, every undergrad is taking mechanics. 
uh, on that. But what I mean is that, okay, whatever, sorry. I, I was wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing something. <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. But it's true that this is the same thing as the Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian mechanics for free particle when you have like the classical symplectic uh, vector space thing, so yeah. Yeah. So this is exactly the expression of uh, Hamilton's equations generated by this Hamiltonian. Or equivalently, this is also the fact that this Hamiltonian generates the action on any observable of your theory by Poisson brackets. That's essentially, that's exactly the same thing. In fact, that's the contraction with the principal active form. And this closes the, the formulation of the other theorem from uh, the phase space point of view. So on the one hand, you have a symmetry other theory that leads to a conserved charge. And uh, on the contrary, you given this charge, this action recovers the symmetry by uh, Hamilton's equations or by taking Poisson brackets or however you prefer to, to, to phrase it. Yeah, actually and, some people call this result the Noder's inverse theorem, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can tell you the one thing that my brain always goes on spins with this is uh, 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 remembering that uh, the different exterior derivative notation. <laughs> I tend to always, every time I see a D that is not a delta, I think of phase space all the time here. In this context, for reason, I need to, uh, I need to reset it with that. So. I must say though, this notation is very clever and this really? is something that Harlow and Wu was adopting recently, right? Because in the old papers by Walt, they actually use the same exterior derivative and assume that you can read them through. <laughs> yeah. 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 This, this is Witten's bond making. Oh yeah. Like, the first time I see, uh, I saw this notation is in Witten's work on covariant phase. Right, right. I, I think so. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I forgot. The most modern one was uh, Harlow and Wu. Yeah. I mean, still. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that I know that Wald uses this notation with delta, but still he writes every phase space differential form explicitly by anti-symmetrizing the evaluation on linearized variation. So it's very clumsy. All, all the expressions look very clumsy. For, uh, the way Wald does it, I think this compact notation is is very very efficient in that sense. I mean, it's kind and of. It also makes a lot of manipulations easier to do. Otherwise, it's hard to. To right. keep track of these proofs of Cartan's magic formula and phase and so on. Right. Yeah. So, so, in fact, you can be more general than that. So, of course, in, part, in this particular case, we were talking about symmetries generated by different morphisms in space time, but that should hold for any infinitesimal variation that gives a symmetry of the action, in the sense that. The very, in the sense that the action varies by a pure bound return. So you can prove, I'm not going to write the proof here because it involves a little bit more than a few, than a few equations, but the proof can be found in the paper by Harlan Wu that we've been referring to. So by any, for any symmetry, that is for any variation of the dynamical field that changes the action by a pure bound return, you can show that using the equations of motion, we got a conserved charge, right? Mm -hmm. That that part of the proof is exactly what we what we did before, right? In the sense that it's not, nothing special. In that case, we only had an explicit formula for what this alpha was, uh, and the reverse also works. So this charge also generates the symmetry and phase space by Hamilton's equation. So that again is it fits very nicely with the way that we have been phrasing another theorem in phase space. So. Yeah, does anybody have a question about this? Okay, so I think I can move on. Uh, now I'm gonna finally discuss what gauge theories are about from this perspective. So some of you may have noticed that I've been calling uh, this omega tilde that we constructed the presymplectic form instead of just symplectic form. That's something that I overlooked completely in the first lecture because I was aiming at the example of the scalar field theory. But now I'm going to be discussing precisely that. So the reason why we, why I was referring to that as pre-symplastic form is because this omega tilde that we constructed so far, uh, the algorithm that we gave is guaranteed to produce a closed two form on phase space because this omega tilde is by definition the delta of something. 
But there is no guarantee a priori that this omega two will be non degenerate, which was also one of the requirements for you to have a, a true symplectic form in phase space. And the algorithm that we gave doesn't guarantee that. And in fact, there are very important cases in which it will be actually degenerate. And when there are degenerate directions, that I will also be referring to as zero modes of the prism platform, that's the case in which we will diagnose that the theory has a gauge symmetry, or, we, or in other words, we have a gauge theory. And the flow along such zero modes will be implementing what we call gauge transformations. And, and I hope to, to give some hints as to why this is reasonable in, in the following slides. Uh, for now, I can say that the existence of these zero modes, one of the implications of the existence of these zero modes, is that Hamilton's equations, the way we phrased it before in the first lecture and now again, no longer fix a unique vector field, x, on the left-hand side, once given a Hamiltonian h on the right-hand side. Because fixing a unique vector field depended on the, on the symplastic form to be invertible. And if it is degenerate, then it's not invertible. So that means in particular, that this vector field is not, is not well defined, which can be phrased as a manifestation of the fact that the initial value problem with the fields that appear on the Lagrangian itself, the, the fields that you treat as dynamical fields on the Lagrangian itself, is no longer well defined. So you can give initial data on a given force case slice, and that will not determine the evolution to the future or to the past because I can always change the configurations by a gauge transformation to the future and to the past without affecting the initial data on the given push slides. In order to eliminate the zero modes and thus render the time evolution well defined, we need some sort of gate facing that is we are used to thinking about when we talk about electromagnetism. So big question, why is the word degenerate used here? Because uh, I would have used words like non-singular, you know, I mean, non-degenerate. Non Why degenerate? For me, the generates is always associated with more than one something. You know what I mean? The generates uh, <laughs> rather than having zero eigenvalues. You know what I mean? Like, a, I don't know. I would have said singular, but the, obviously that's not what is used. So I wonder why the generate. Yeah, I never thought about it. So just... uh, I just want to say that my symplectic geometry textbook use degenerate. So no, no, I, I know it's the useful. I know it's yeah. useful. I'm, I'm just curious to know why the generate. <laughs> Yeah. Because there are more than two axes that give the same delta H. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That would explain it. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's funny because I usually think, I guess because I think, in, I, I'm too much of a thinker in coordinates, I guess. Because I always think of it as in like, a, 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 when, when you think in coordinates, it makes so much sense to call it non singular rather than generate. Yeah, the, 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 the general reason is the equivalence between having a kernel equal to zero and a matrix that is invertible. That's right, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Ivan. That's actually answering my question on points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so something that I would like to mention here is that in this sense from seeing gauge transformations as zero modes of the prism plastic form or degenerate directions of the prism plastic form, there's a trivial way in which you can assign some notion of conserved charge because from the point of view of Hamilton's equations, you can always define a phase space function Q that satisfies Hamilton's equations with that, that vector field, as long as this is a constant on phase space, right? So this is indicating the fact that other charges from gauge symmetries can always be set identically to your own shell and that is related to the fact that gauge symmetries, in fact, don't lead to dynamical uh, conserved quantities. They also lead to, they actually lead to constraints on the phase space. So this is one example of a constraint. So some, some function that can be set identically equal to zero to be non-dynamical on the phase space. There are a lot more words that, that can be said about this, but I'm not gonna bother to, say, to talk about it now. In, in case anybody wants to, to discuss this, uh, I'd be glad to, but make, uh, otherwise we can move on. But this observation will be important in, in a few minutes. Uh, now, I, I, I'm sorry, you, say, you said that you didn't want to talk about it, but I, can you then just repeat it? Because I don't think I, I got the point. Because the, like in usual non-covariant phase space, uh, we, the, the starting point 
does have a well-defined symplectic form, but we obtained the pre-symplectic form in a certain sense by applying the constraints, right? The constraints give you a, give you a, a the constraint phase space, which has a degenerate symplectic form. In the covariant phase yeah. space, you only see the constraint surface because you yeah. already see that there are solutions. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a subtlety that I didn't want to discuss, but since you brought it up, we can. We can. So the idea is that somehow this prism platform, the way that it's built from the Lagrangian, is already taking, taking care of the primary constraints, so let's say, from the direct point of view, right? So that is essentially what's giving you. So, so there is one set of constraints that's already taken care of, and that gives you a degenerative classic form. Okay. Now, well, I, I thought I thought that at some another. point you 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 had mentioned that you can give a covariant notion to that big phase space of Qs and Ps in the presence of constraints. That's not true, right? There is no covariant definition of of the big phase space of Qs and Ps with a non-degenerate symplectic form, right? I don't think so, because the way that we did it, it takes as an input already the Lagrangian, and the information cool. of some of those constraints are already in the Lagrangian. Perfect. OK, cool. Thanks. So, so yeah, another thing that's interesting to note here is that zero modes of the symplectic form form an algebra. That is, the if you take two zero modes, their commutator is also a zero mode. The proof is is displayed here. It's basically just, again, using Cartan's magic formula and the fact that the omega tilde is by construction close. And you, and you show that if x and y are uh, zero modes, then so is the commutator. That means that the zero mode form a Lie algebra, as we'll say, that can thus can be identified as the Lie algebra over the Lie group that we will promote as the gauge group of the theory. Now, if, if you guys know something about the standard model and, and the Agnes theory, you're very used to doing the opposite. So you, you're used to taking your favorite gauge, gauge group and you're given a recipe to write an action that by construction is, is invariant, is locally invariant under gauge transformation by that gauge group. What I'm claiming here is that if you're smart enough and I just give you uh, the action of yang mills theory for SU3, for example, and you, and, you, and you proceed with this algorithm to identify the zero modes of the symplectic form, and I never told you that I built that action from a yang mills theory of SU3, you would eventually be able to, to derive, again, the algebra, the Lie algebra of SU3. I, I don't expect this to be obvious a priori, but that is what happens. So, so, so one question something. I always had, and this is even before, so the conserved quantity associated to, to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, a nether flow associated to gauge transformations, you say here, nether charges from gauge symmetries can be said to be identically zero on, cell, on shell. Can you elaborate more what you mean by that? Uh, yeah, so when, when in the case of, so there's a subtle difference, at least I think, if you're talking about the case of gauge, theory, uh, gauge theories in, in toy examples and particle mechanics, and when you're talking about fields that, that display some gauge. Like electromagnetism. In the case, yeah, in a, so when you have a field theory, in fact, what this will lead to is constraints that appear in the form of Bianchi identities. Okay. So yes. they, so that's so that's what happens. In the case of electromagnetism, for instance, there's the pi zero equals zero constraint that comes from the Lagrangian, but there's also the constraint that that gives Gauss law, right? So that's a that that's that's the the, an, the analog of what's happening here. Okay. Yes, that the the notion of on shell is something that we can talk about for a general theory. So it was a bit vague for me what you meant by this. <laughs> uh, yeah, on, on shell for me is always meaning when the equations of motion are satisfied. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's something that I, I don't remember claiming explicitly, but that's that's useful to keep in mind. Anyway, so we know from electromagnetism that there's another way of thinking about gauge theories, probably the one that people are most used to, 
That is in terms of redundancies to the description of the physical system. That means that gauge theories, then this gauge transformation that I've been talking about, actually encodes redundancies on what we call the physical information that, that is conveyed by the physics. In other words, I actually want to think of solutions to the equations of motion that are connected by gauge transformations as representing the same points on the physical phase space. Right? Mathematically, this is implemented by taking a quotient. So we can define, once we have defined the, the present plastic form and the zero volts of that, we can define this enhanced phase space. Some, some people usually will refer to this as the phase space and the speed and the pizza will be free phase space. Why not? Why define not? It. So physical phase space, why not physical phase space rather than enhanced or the phase space? Uh, it's just because I started calling it phase space from from the beginning, and but but some people usually like to be consistent. Maybe I should have called it pre phase space at the beginning. That's how Harlow and will use. Yeah, okay. And now this will be the phase space because this is the space. This is the the set that has a non degenerate enclosed symplectic form. Right. Right. I guess, so, I guess like, technically speaking. Uh, phase space, you want phase space uh, to be a symplectic manifold, so yeah. you, need to, uh, you need to have the inverse too. So I guess, I guess in that sense, you're entitled to call that phase space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. It's just that for some reason, I thought it would be better to not refer to pre phase space all the time until talking right. about gauge symmetry. So that's why I, I chose not to. Mm -hmm. So, but in any case, by taking these quotients with by the gauge group and transporting the, the presymplectic form now to P instead of the P tilde, we have uh, uh, a two form on the space space that is closed by construction because it was already closed in P tilde. And now we killed all the degenerate directions, so it is not degenerate. And now we have all the machinery to talk about a, a legitimate phase space. Uh, now, uh, just this, a small question here. So you say that the G tilde is, uh, is the action of a gauge group, right? Yes. Yeah, but from the previous slide, all I know is just the Lie algebra. Is that enough? Uh, I'll be taking that as a yes. Yes. So you can associate the Lie algebra with a simply connected Lie group, something. So I, I, yeah, I don't, I, I'm always... not caring that much about the details, but yes, that's intuition. Okay. But but in fact, right, right. Uh, Maybe Ivan has more things to say about it, but the, the, the bottom line here is that this quotient part is very much, much easier said than done. And in principle, there are some go. What? Yeah, and nothing. This is, the, yeah, as you were saying, this is probably not uh, super correct and certainly can only be done infinitesimally in general. This is why yeah. this is so famous in perturbation theory, but not in. Well, yeah, so, uh, but so the point are... though is that is that at least if we were talking about finite dimensional systems, like if we weren't doing field theory but just mechanics, uh, then you can integrate this because of Frobenius theorem. So the, this does define a well uh, group, which in this case, this group is the flow along the vector fields uh, of zero modes, uh, which defines a group acting on phase space, and you can take the quotient. What what is true in general is that that's gonna not gonna be a manifold anymore. Be some weird or behold thing. Yeah. Yeah, and in the case in the case of of field theories, more generally, you, you get other global obstructions to actually computing this question, right? Isn't that what the Grebov problem is all about? Right? You can yeah, do that. that's that's what I thought though. It's like the yeah. Grebov ambiguity should enter through the way you caution this thing, right? But yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Okay. Is it such a physicist so, thing? Because I was so satisfied thinking, sure, I mean, you have a Lie algebra, obviously you can talk yeah. about <laughs> But no, you're so right, yeah. That's a good, yeah. really good point to make. Uh, yeah, so, so now I think we've talked enough about the, the abstract general facts. Now I think it's, it's nice to see a little bit of how that works in the next in example. So let's take our our most well-known gauge theory, the theory of electromagnetism, whose action is described by this. So I chose to write both in, in indices form and in differential and in, in, in differential forms form, <laughs> where 
where this F is the electromagnetic strength tensor and the A is the electropotential, or if you prefer components, that's the expression in terms of, of the AMU. Okay. Now, again, you can apply the algorithm that we've been discussing. So you take the linearized variation of the Lagrangian. There's a term that's going to be proportional to that A, and there will be the boundary term. The, the term that gives the equation of motion will give you Maxwell's equations that here you can identify in, in, in differential forms or in components. And the precipitative potential, again, is just the boundary term. The precipitative form is going to be taking deltas of, of this on phase space, and then the equation becomes this. Now, we know that we have an independent notion of the local symmetries of that action that's given by variations of the fields, given by gradients of arbitrary functions, lambda, lambda right? Which define uh, vector fields on phase space because they take solutions to new solutions to other solutions that I can write again like this. Now, as a test, we can see what happens when we plug this vector field on the expression of the prism plastic form that we had. What happens then is the following. Now, this is, in order to follow this calculation, all you need to do is remember that, like from the first line to the second, I use the fact that the F satisfies the equation of motion, so the star F is zero. Uh, from the second to the third, I use uh, Stokes theorem and from the third to the last one, I use the fact that this lambda is a function on space time that does not depend on the dynamical fields. So what I showed here is that the contraction of this vector field with the prism plastic form is not identically zero, but it gives you a quantity that is fully located in the boundary of each Cauchy slice, of the Cauchy slice, Cauchy slice that I use to define the, the space Wait, of science. Where did you use that that lambda does not depend on a? To say that this delta, the, to say that I could pull the delta here off of the integral. But that would be bad can... if you want to couple this to gravity, right? Because when you when you in general, if you do to if you couple this to gravity and you include the diffeomorphism as a zero mode, uh, the commutator of two diffeomorphisms is going to be some gauge transformation of a, which is dependent of a. Lambda is going to be dependent on a. So, so is this? Um, so, the, the, does that mean that x lambda stops being? So, the, this has to do with a question that I didn't understand how, uh, before. But there are systems. I'm sorry that I cannot. Well, I guess this is the example where um, where the gauge group is not a group that much, right? Because the gauge group depends on. Like you cannot act with a single, the, the way, the group element that you choose depend on the point in phase space that you're in, right? Yeah, yeah. So I guess what I can say is that, like, I, I don't know, I haven't worked out the example of how that works with electromagnetism and gravity, except for the fact that in that case, you can think of the two, two sets separately, right? So you can think of a gauge transformation that acts as a diffeomorphism and this independent gauge transformation that is simply the gradient of a function. Now, but in you this can't sense here, because the, the commutators are going to mix them. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but maybe, maybe well, my, my question is much more simpler than coupling to gravity. The, choosing lambda to be dependent of A is also a gauge transformation. Like if you, uh, if you like from normal electromagnetism, if I shift A, but I deem mu of lambda with lambda depending on the A, so that I, I choose to uh, do a different gauge transformation for every single one of the fields, that is still a gauge transformation of the theory. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's right. Not, not only it's a gauge transformation of the field, it's a very common gauge transformation of the field. We right. do it all the time in quantum optics, all the time. I mean, uh, the, you get generating function to be, I mean, the transformation to be the transformation itself, e to the i charge a, that's a typical gauge transformation. So your chi there is uh, definitely a, <laughs> actually. So that, will that is true. Okay, so, okay. so, so what I can say is that if you assume that this lambda is independent of a, this works out. 
I guess that can be an argument that it didn't work out as to how this could argue, how this could happen if the lambda itself is dependent on A, but the argument gets more no, But you see, even, even, in, even in useful quantum optics, this has consequences that, I mean, for example, maybe Richard, if Richard's here, Richard can say some things about that. You can have the fact that your, that your gauge constraint has dynamics, and because of that, uh, time evolution and your gauge constraint don't commute, and then you get the commutator of your time evolution, you, without formalizing it that much, just talking regular quantum mechanics formalism. When you have a gauge transformation that depends on something that doesn't commute with your generator of time translations, then uh, you're going to have non-trivial effects that come from the commutator of the, trans the gauge transformation and, uh, and dynamics. And then you, have to, uh, then you have to take that into account. I mean, this kind of, you would have modified, you don't have Schrodinger equation anymore if you want. You have Schrodinger equation plus something else. And that plus something else is precisely the part that comes from the commutator between the gauge transformation and your dynamics, whatever generates your dynamics. So I wonder how important is 31, the last step, and what you're going to tell us? Uh, well, you'll see the next slide here. Okay. So the, now, in the simplified case, where, as I've been saying, the gauge parameter does not depend on the few configurations, you can, one thing that you can say is that if the gauge parameter approaches zero near the boundary of each spatial section, then the vector fields that we defined indeed constitute zero modes by because, because equation 31 here only includes an integral that's evaluated on the on the boundary of each Cauchy slice. However, uh, yeah, and then if you cons if you constrain the solutions to satisfy some gate fixing condition, these zero modes can, can be eliminated by the usual the usual way that, you, that we know how to work out. However, if this lambda does not go to zero near near the spatial boundary. This apparent gauge transformation will lack non-trivial in phase space in the sense that you can assign that uh, non-vanishing charge that can have non-zero commutators with other functions on, on phase space, other theory. And the charge is explicitly given by, by, by this, right? This is just identifying whatever is being taken, taken delta of in equation 31. So, what this suggests is that these gauge transformations that act not trivial on the boundary do become somehow physical symmetries. Uh, and we will see that this is very much related to something that also happens in the case of gravity when you have non-trivial non boundary structures on your space time. So this equation 32 here is very much connected with the notion of, of soft hair in electromagnetism as is addressed, for example, in in Strominger's notes that I referred to in the first slide, that give you a tower of infinite conserved charges in scattering events of the electromagnetic field, for instance, that are associated with these gauge transformations dependent on the angle that act on, on infinity. So, yeah, I guess that's something that you should keep in mind when you're talking about gauge theories in the presence of boundaries, and we'll see how that also is the case in gravity. So, so here, Bruno, so a couple of things. I guess the argument can still be done, perhaps not as cleanly, but the argument can still be done. I don't think the argument is obstructed if you don't have that last step. Uh, yeah, I think so too. It's just that I, I didn't put much thought into that. Right. And, but, but I'm pretty sure that, I mean, I know for a fact that I've, heard, I, I've read statements that say that. So right. there is more complicated things that happen when your gauge transformation is field dependent. But the arguments evolve. But it's, it's this tricky because the simplest and the most physically helpful gauge transformation I can think of, which is going in, in electromagnetism from the Coulomb gauge to the multipolar gauge, it's called the Poincare gauge when you do it covariantly. That one is field dependent. <laughs> yeah, that is true. So, so that, that's one of the most common. That's the one that permits you to use quantum optics uh, because then you go to that transformation and then you see under some approximation, the transformation makes things very simple and you have a multiple expansion and stuff. But you see, this is the most, perhaps the most common gauge transformation or the most useful, if you want, gauge transformation uh, in electromagnetism and already that one, that is the kind of transformation we're talking about. These integrals of something that goes with, uh, it dep definitely, the, the gauge function depends on A. It's literally A. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, that was a big oversight of mine. So, yeah, but I think the message, yeah. the message here is clear. I mean, I don't so, know, I can tell you right away, but it feels to me that you can still do make that argument without that. Yeah. Just more complicated, right? But, uh, so, because your argument is yeah. a negative one, not a positive one. You're not saying this is this. It's saying, ah, you're going to have uh, 
you're going to have, uh, in the presence of boundaries, you're going to have a non-vanishing charge. I think that's probably yeah. going to be true. <laughs> you know? yeah. If you get it in the simplest case with Lambda is independent on, a, on the field, I think in the general case, I, I have no reason why not. Yeah. I, I know that in the case of gravity, there's, a, there's very much that people do because this is, this is very much associated with this recent trend of soft hair in black holes and so on. That sometimes you need for completely different reasons, or maybe there are related reasons, I don't know, to, to assign gauge transformations that are field dependent. And this all works out as well. So I, I think it's reasonable to expect that. The easiest way was that one, but it can be generalized. To, to the more general case. Yeah. So, okay. So in, now in the case of gravity, what, what happens? So in, in gravity, for any, after Einstein, we expect every reasonable gravitational theory to display general different morphism invariants, which in particular will imply that the Lagrangian L does not have any, any background fields. And that's one way of satisfying that. And, Therefore, the, in general, the Lagrangian will be covariance under arbitrary diffeomorphisms psi. So the requirement for the action to vary by a boundary term will be true no matter what diffeomorphism psi you pick. If that's the case, then you can show, and the proof is, is displayed by this paper by Iron Walls. That's a very standard reference in there that not only that J that we define for each diffeomorphism that I co covariantly on the Lagrangian generates a closed form on shell when the equation of motion are satisfied, but it can also be shown that this J is also exact. So this J will be the exterior derivative of some D minus two form that Ironwald usually called the another charge D minus two form. In this case, then, the Hamiltonian associated to this diffeomorphism uh, is reduced to a pure boundary term located entirely in the boundary of the spatial sections or the Cauchy slices that you chose to compute the, your various quantity. So as you can see, this is very reminiscent. One comparison that you can make is that this is very reminiscent of the, the boundary term that we saw in electromagnetism. And you can also argue that this is somehow, like very loosely speaking, pointing towards some nature of gravity as being holographic. So there is no local degrees of freedom uh, of gravitational theory. The, all the observables, all the non-vanishing observables are located at boundaries. So uh, as I was saying, uh, for a diffeomorphism invariant theory, all the diffeomorphism charges are evaluated on spatial boundaries on space time. And therefore, if your spatial sections uh, possess some non-trivial boundary structure, it could be at a finite distance, or it can be also asymptotically, in the case of asymptotically flat space science, for instance. These would be gauge transformations that act not trivial on the boundary, non-vanishing contributions at the boundary, become physical symmetries with associated non-vanishing charges. That's what we that, that's what we've been showing here. And this is actually well known. This is related to the notion of edge modes in gravitational theories that are a concept that's very important, for instance, to, again, define lotion, the notion of local observables in spatial sections in general relativity, and also making make, make sense of things such as entanglement entropy in diffeomorphism invariant theory. So that's just something that I wanted to, to point out. Now, in the particular case of general relativity, the, you can define the theory from the Einstein-Hilbert action, where the Lagrangian is given by the Ricci scalar, right? And by now, you, you all know what the algorithm will look like. You're going to take the linear iteration of this. The, the term that's linear on the variations will give you Einstein's equations. And the boundary term, maybe that's a little bit less well known, but probably most of you know, have seen this already. If you derive the Einstein equation from the Einstein Hilbert action, it looks something like this, where this theta is better described as a one form that, from which I took the, the Hodge rule. Now, the formula here is not that important. All that I want to, 
to say is that now if you take these diffeomorphisms acting on the metric itself by the derivative on the metric, one can explicitly verify that the conserved current that we defined is indeed given by the exterior derivative of something. And this something again is best written as the Hodge dual of this two form that's precisely given by the exterior derivative of the xi within this is Dapser. That means that um, in this case, the conserved charge takes the form of a coma integral, if, you, if you've seen what it is, on the boundary of each Cauchy surface xi. So that's the, that, that's the expression that you use, for example, in asymptotically flat space times to compute the notion of energy, of, AD, of ADM energy from the killing vector, uh, the time-like killing vector. It's also what gives you the angular momentum in asymptotically flat space times. Uh, if you plug psi here as the generator of rotations, as the, the rotational killing vector, and it also generalizes to the more general BMS charges associated to asymptotic symmetries in asymptotically flat space times, right? So this is also related to the notion of soft hair now in the case of gravitational theories. So the, as I was saying, these apparent gauge, gauge degrees of freedom that become physical at the boundaries are associated to what is usually called soft hair. And I've explicitly talked about the case of asymptotic flat space times, in particular in the case of black hole in space times with black holes. Uh, diffeomorphism that act not trivially on the black hole horizon, that's also going to have a contribution to the boundary of the Cauchy slices outside of, of the black hole, will also contribute to the nomination charges in the gravitational phase space. And I just wanted to point out that this has become a, a trend in the gravitational community, community. And I believe we have reasons to, to think that for a very general class of space times, these diffeomorphisms that act on the boundary of, of the Cauchy slice on the horizon of the black hole, so at the bifurcation surface of the black hole, are somehow encompassing the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field that contribute to the Bekenstein Hawking entry. So I'm signing here results that we've been put out a, a few months ago by me and some collaborators that work together in the PI Winter School. That's okay, so, so Bruno, I mean, I know that maybe that's an, a subject for a different talk, right? Yes. But, but uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a strong claim. Uh, I know. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you give some, like, I don't know, intuition about this? Because you see, all the degrees of freedom that contribute to the bekenstein hawking entropy is difficult for me to believe. Because uh, I can also see that, in, again, argument, there are many other degrees of freedom that have this kind of behavior of area law in a black hole. How about the quantum fields that are on top of, the, of gravity? You know, I mean, that also satisfies similar Bekenstein Hawking entropy. You would have contribution from all of them where you have an event horizon. Yeah, I know. So the perspective here that I'm taking is that you've got to somehow be able to. To, to give a notion of the black hole, the black hole entropy, by talking about gravitational degrees of freedom, right? Now, the fact that entanglement entropy gives some area law behavior if you put quantum fields on top of black hole background can also be included, but that will amount to so in the case of a scalar field and spin orbital and so on, that can be included as a renormalization of Newton's constants, for example. That's usually what happens, that the leading order divergence is proportional to the area, and so you can absorb that into a redefined Newton's constant. But, and, and that will carry a contribution to the entropy in the sense that now somehow the, the gravitational coupling itself, with respect to the entropy, is dependent on how many spe species of fields and matter you have on your background. But, but I think that from the purely gravitational point of view, you can also make a case that the black hole entropy is zero before, and that's what we've been claiming in this. Okay, so here's, a, here's some thoughts again, Naif, again. And this is, I know that you probably talk about this in a separate talk when you talk okay. about your work. But uh, certainly, I know that uh, you can get uh, gravitational contributions that go like area law, right? If you, even if you do linearized gravity, which would be nothing but another field on top, right? 
yeah. that would already contribute with similar things. So I'm pretty sure that I have nothing against the fact that gravity also contributes to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy rate of a black hole somehow. Uh, is the fact that you claim that uh, encompass all the degrees of freedom, all of them. That is what I have an issue with. And yeah, okay, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm also okay with not saying that it encompasses all the degrees of freedom if you're thinking about, about fields that sit on top of the black hole and so on. I, I'm just addressing this from the purely GR perspective that I, I should be is this in terms of gravitational degrees of freedom only. Okay. Now, you can assign that. So what we did is not unlike if you were putting like linearized perturbations like gravitons and something. So in that sense, that's the okay. trivial fact here is that the trivial fact here for me is also that, well, I don't know, the different morphisms that act on the black hole horizon are already everything that you need in order to... Then I think, I, I think we both agree. Like gravity alone would give you some entropy, of course, yeah. for the yeah. black hole. Now, again, if the black hole has to imagine... Now, sadly, we haven't seen black holes evaporating yet, but if the black hole had to operate only due to gravity, maybe it would take much longer. There would be much, way much more long-lived than if it were evaporated through the fact that there are quantum fields present. Yeah. Because if you have to evaporate only through gravitational wave emission, yeah, that's going to take you a while. I mean, it already takes you a while well, if you have photons to evaporate to, but my point being that, um, that yeah, I think the claim of all is a little bit scary. You know what I mean? So, like, people are going to object to that. Yeah, but, no, I, I, I see where you're coming from. But I, but I think we agree. Now that, like, no, no, that's cool. Clearer. It's a super cool. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's nice. It's kind of a nice, if you've done this more rigorously and with this kind of formalism, it's kind of a kind of very rigorous way of seeing that, yes, indeed. I mean, you're going to have, you expect it in a way, I guess, but this is how, and you can actually get, and here's some examples where you can actually see a Bekenstein Hawking entropy emerging out of uh, just pure gravity, right? That's what you yeah. probably have. Yeah, actually, yeah. on that related note, right, I have something very stupid that I never understood, and maybe you can say something about it. So, this area over four thing, right, if you use the covariant phase space formalism, right, it will be obtained as an integ. It can be obtained purely as a geometric integral where you simply integrate the so-called uh, variations of the Lagrangian with respect to the Riemann tensor. That's what Walt did, right? Yeah, that's one. But point. but that's but one. you if you put fields on top of it, right? They don't contribute to this Walt entropy, right? Because they don't. They are not functions of the Riemann tensor. So it looks to uh, me that yeah. if you do Walt entropy calculation and get A over four, it looks to me that it's purely gravitational. So, no. but, but Erickson, but there are more contributions to it. So the thing is that that entropy that you would have will have also contributions coming from other degrees of freedom. So in, if you have free gravity, sir, if you have free gravity coupled to quantum fields, well, you're gonna have contributions to entropy coming from the other systems that have micro degrees of freedom there. No, that, that's, that's where the problem I have is. My, I always thought that the way, the way other fields enter through the picture is through the ADMS, but I don't really understand this because if you, if you run through Walt's calculation, right, even if you, so long as your Lagrangian is not, for example, conformally coupled, right, that means there's no explicit dependence on the Riemann tensor, right, the other fields will not enter the contribution to the Walt entropy, which gives you area over four. That's, that's the part where I don't I never really understood, unless I did something wrong there, but... No, but the area law is not the same. I mean, you also need to match the constants in, on top, like the part that, it, that Bruno called renormalization. That, those are the... So I agree, you would have a contribution that has this, the right law, but that's not the only contribution. You have other contributions with the same law. Yeah, and, and I don't very see... Naive because I'm talking about them independently. When you have a full couple theory, you cannot talk about them independently. But imagine that it's like like you can think of it independently you have contributions coming from all the degrees of freedom that no you it, no I, I understand that part so it seems to me that either the area over four right can mean two things uh including the fields or without the fields and the, the number a gives different number but they are still area over four but i i don't know because from the perspective of a solution to einstein field equations uh coupled to gra with fields coupled to gravity the What's going to change is that, for example, if electromagnetism coupled to gravity, you get Reissner Nordstrom black hole, right? Your area is going to contain contributions yeah. from the charge of the black hole. But I think the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is not the final solution. I personally, what I, what I feel is that the Bekenstein Hawking entropy 
perhaps you can actually get the Bekenstein Hopkins algorithm with just gravity alone. But of course, the, the entropy of a black hole will depend, for example, on the number of species. And, the, and, and of course, the different number of species will give you a different prefactor, right? So maybe uh, area over four is just the gravitational contribution. And then you will have contributions coming from other theories on top that will give correction with the same scaling law that would correct that prefactor one over four, right? I mean, that's may, maybe, maybe what you're saying is that maybe with only gravity, you will one over four. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, my, all I'm saying is that if you take a charged black hole, right? Yeah. It is still area over four, but that area over four is not the same as the area over four for Svarsel because there's a charge entering the area. That's right. Yeah. So that's how I thought that the Maxwell's, the, the, the electromagnetism entered the entropy contribution by changing the actual value of A through the charge of the, of the Maxwell's, uh, Maxwell's equation. I am not sure about that though. So yeah, I see what you mean, but I'm not sure about that because the contributions that I'm thinking of are simply the, the entanglement entropy of the field. Yeah, uh, that's, that's different. I'm, yeah. All I'm saying is all classical field. I'm not doing right. any semi-classical regime. So if you include the field that is quantum, then of course, if there is any correction to A over four, I am not that surprised, but right. what I never understood is that even classically, right, it feels that the Bekenstein Hawking entropy computed using Walsh method ignores all the, okay, probably it doesn't ignore, I guess it does, con it does enter through the charge of the Maxwell field. Okay, forget yeah, about it. The fact that the area can depend on whatever species of fields you have, for example. So yeah, 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 okay. On the mass or in the charge and the angle momentum, is already an indicator of that. So, but it, but what that was in mind. Forget about what I said. Yeah, so. it's, it's kind of stupid. Yeah. Uh, so okay, that's that's pretty much what I had. So the just to summarize what we discussed, another theorem can be formulated in a geometric way on phase space, via the covariant phase space formalism, as we just saw. Uh, we discuss how gauge invariance and gauge fixing can be, can be defined geometrically in terms of the zero modes of the prism platter form that we can derive algorithmically from, from the Lagrangian of the field theory. We gave some hints as to the fact that boundary terms are important, even though I paid no attention at all to them. In, the, in this presentation, because there's risk physics in what seems to be the apparent degrees of gauge degrees of freedom that can become physical in the presence of boundaries. So this is something that, for instance, in the quantum gravity community, it's been very popular, I, I think. So there are some discussions about how you can actually define a proper symplectic form by simply putting extra total, uh, total derivative terms on, on the einstein hilbert action, so like the, the gibbons hawking term and others, and how that affects the symmetry algebra from the charges that are evaluated on quickly surfaces. But that's a much subtle, subtler topic, so that's why I didn't want to address it here. Now I just wanted to give you a glimpse on why you should care about boundary term when you have a gauge theory in particular. So uh, now, I like to finish my talks raising some questions that I, I don't know how to answer just to, to, to give more room to for people to think. So one question that I was not the one who brought up, but that's something that's popular is what role does soft hair play on the information loss plot problem for black holes, for instance? So the soft hair is intimately associated with gauge symmetries, which for instance, are not present if you're talking about a scalar field theory. So if, you're, if you do it properly and you account for the fact that you have such a thing as super translations and so on, does that teach you anything about information laws or is it completely irrelevant? So that's something that Hawking, Perry, and Strominger have put forward a, few, a couple of years ago. And different people think different things about it. Wall, for instance, doesn't see any, any promising effect on that. But that's something that's an open problem, I think. From the point of view of RQI, maybe something that you can ask is, is there any way that particle detectors can probe these degrees of freedom associated to edge modes on a gauge theory? And in particular, something that could come to mind is, if these edge modes are necessary to make sense of entanglement entropy, for instance, and entanglement measures in, in the case of gauge theories, 
do they have any effects on entanglement harvesting through, through particle detectors that couple to gauge fields? I think that may be reminiscent of the ambiguity that Eduardo and, and Erickson have discussed on when you have scarce theories on, on the boundaries or, or in systems with boundaries. So, but there, there's definitely got to be something else here because a scalar field doesn't exhibit a gauge theory. So I have a related question to, to that, uh, because I was thinking when we were talking about, uh, again, this is one of those cases that you have gauge transformations, even to build a model, right? That you have gauge transformations um, that depend on, on the phase space variables. But, um, but if I have a theory in a cavity, say, electromagnetism in a cavity, and say that I even look at it for a finite amount of time, so I do have boundaries in my space time. And uh, still, I'm not sure what it would mean for gauge degrees of freedom to become physical in that scenario. You see, I mean, like the thing is that even what boundary conditions do, how do you impose boundary conditions in electromagnetism is slightly on trivial. Because the way we physically know what it means to impose boundary conditions on an electromagnetic field is related to imposing the conditions on the physical fields, not on the gauge fields. So it, typically you say, oh yeah, you have a superconductor, you're canceling one component of the electric field and another component of the magnetic field on the boundaries. So you are putting constraints on the boundaries for sure. But those constraints are not directly put on the gauge fields. So when you, when you have things like, um, like uh, again, it's funny because the, what the conditions are for the fundamental fields, if you want, in this case, would be the gauge fields. What the conditions are what, are, what are physical boundary conditions in electromagnetism? How do you express them in terms of conditions on the gauge fields? I don't think I know the answer to that. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And I also don't know what. what but it, it may be like. interesting to look so, into. Yeah. Again, those so, theories are, are not covariant in a way that the boundaries that you pick and so on break the, the, well, the spatial, the, the Lorentz covariant that you would have. But it can certainly be formulated in terms of what you have here. Yeah, I know, I know that there is a very sophisticated technology involving these edge modes when you have different morphism invariant the or otherwise different morphism invariant theories in the presence of boundaries. But I have no idea how that would, how that would impact, for instance, if you have an electromagnetic field coupled to a detector in a cavity and how, how that could be. But that's but something that should be able to be done. That's funny because those are quantum field theories in space time with boundaries still. Yeah. And it's a gauge theory too. It's yeah. just that the, the, in the boundary we're very being non-trivial about what happens in the boundary. We are imposing, yeah. in a way we're imposing boundary conditions on the, on the constraints faced on the phase space, on the, what you call phase space. <laughs> so we're not imposing the boundary conditions on the pre-symplectic space, if you want. We're imposing yeah. it on phase space. And um, yeah, I don't know, I mean, honestly. Uh, maybe something to to look into a little bit more for fun and to see what yeah. to talk about this maybe imagine that you can do quantum optics in cavities in covariant phase space that would be amazing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's also this thing that related uh, possibly tangential only tangentially related is something that finn and i was thinking about is that you 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 might have seen the paper by compare about uh the matter induced super translations yeah i've seen the paper but i haven't yeah so properly read it. what what they show is that if you have some kind of super translation but not in this sense but induced by matter for example you send a shock wave into the space time yeah. right what happens is that the way it shows off it at the bogolibov transformation right makes it such that the hawking and the 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 unru effect the spectrum is exactly the same, which means you cannot detect it in the vacuum, but it appears at the face of the Bogolibov transformation, which means you at least need a non-vacuum state of the field in order to see this effect. So I'm not sure if this is going to end up kind of related to this kind of stuff, whether it is generic that uh, you need to kind of climb up to non-vacuum states of the field in order to see some of these effects. But they did it in the Bogolibov thing. So Finn and I was wondering whether there's a way to simply recover the language in terms of detectors. But... Yeah, that's, that's definitely something that, that would be worth looking, at, looking more into. I, I don't have anything tomorrow to say about it. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I have. Okay, go ahead.
And yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> right, wonderful. Yeah, that was great. Um, I don't, uh -huh. I, I'm still thinking, oh, go ahead, Ivan, Ivan, yeah. Oh, no, Eduardo, were you going to ask questions? I can do it after you. That's okay. No, 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 you go ahead. I'm always go, going, but I don't want to monopolize, so you go ahead. Okay. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Maybe we can we can do one on one. Uh, but the first question is sort of more on the sort of things that I like, um, like the more physical, um, the more philosophical, sorry, and more useless questions, maybe, uh, which is on on what are your like after doing this, what is your perspective towards what a gauge symmetry like? There are a ton of in the literature perspective of what a gauge symmetry is. Here you mentioned two, which was the zero modes of this principle form, but you also mentioned that gauge symmetries were redundancies, and in a certain sense, uh, from the first one you can say, okay, zero modes are definitely redundancies, but it's not clear to me that redundancies are zero modes. And what does this have to do with the more Yangmill's point of view of gauge symmetries as being X dependent symmetries as being, uh, as being symmetries whose parameters depend on X um, and, and if they're related in any way? Uh, okay, let's see. Yeah. My perspective on gauge symmetries is pretty much what I presented here. So that's the way that I, that I like to think of them better because, I don't know, that's probably my bias towards Hamiltonian mechanics as opposed to anything else. So and the reason why I, I can relate that with redundancies is precisely because of the fact that thinking of the gauge transformations as redundancies is what leads to, to how do you say? This is what leads, it, leads you to a process that can define a unique time evolution or what you call the physical degrees of freedom of the system. Now, when you ask about Yang Mills theory and the fact that you build the theory from the requirements that there is a local symmetry that already encompasses some sort of redundancy on the theory, I mean, I, don't know. I mean, it's just the fact that there are, I can assure you that there are people, that there are physicists who, if you ask them what a gauge symmetry is, they're going to answer, it's a symmetry whose parameter depends on X. Yeah, I know. And I like, and I want to say that those, in every possible example that you can think of, will be equivalent. That's what I'm tempted to say, because whatever it is you're going to do, you're going to build then a theory from an action that displays this local invariance. And the fact that you have this local invariance that depends on X is essentially what is encompassed by a freedom to choose the solutions to the equations of motion in a way that's not determined by initial data. So it all has to somehow like be woven together. But I'm I, it is true that I, I don't have a more direct answer. Uh, Ivan, uh, Ivan, so just a related uh, question to your question. So, so remember there's this thing in the presentation that the vector field generated by the symmetry is an integral over some stuff with the vector field basis, right? So for the case of a gauge transformation, right, is some partial of lambda, right? So wouldn't, wouldn't it say that if, if your gauge transformation depends on X, you are saying that in general, this vector field is not zero. Because if I take a global gauge symmetry, right, then this corresponds to the zero vector field in phase space. But that is not, that, that was special of this symmetry. If you take a rotation, for example, a rotation with a fixed uh, 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 gauge parameter would have had, instead of that, the mu lambda would have had something like omega mu nu X nu, which is something that, depends on X and it's an integrand, which is X dependent, but the omega mu nu is what is constant. So from a mathematical point of view, this is even very distressing because there doesn't seem to be a clear definition of what it means for the gauge parameter 
of the transformation to be x mm -hmm. determined, right? It is, it is not like, it is definitely not that the coefficient of the vector field yeah. is x in, uh, dependent because the parameter, the, in general, the coefficient is x dependent, even with the parameter being constant, like in uh, rotation. I was going to say uh, something related to it. The, the, I don't think the two definitions are equivalent. And if you ask me which definition is better, I would go with Bruno. In the sense I agree. To me, uh, gauge theories are, are very physical. So uh, from the very physicist point of view, if you go full physics, it's like, right, I got an action. The action comes from first principles. I am informed about the first principles through observation, and I will an action. Now, it so happens that my action has symmetries that are extra symmetries than the, the thing that I can actually measure. I'm going to have extra symmetry that it's just a matter of the choice that I made of, uh, of the first principles that I have. I have an extra freedom in it. So I agree with Bruno's definition 100%. So if you don't modify the equations of motion <laughs> of the physical fields uh, through a group of transformations, of transformations, that's for me what a gauge theory is. Certainly, I agree. I, agree. I think that, that the redundancies definition is the better, but, but I don't see uh, a definite connection between defining it. So first of all, I think that the, that the definition in terms of the parameters being x-dependent is very bad definition. Uh, there are the other two definitions, which was redundancies and, and degeneracy of the symplectic form. Now, I think that redundancies is better, and I am very skeptical towards those two being the same because, first of all, if you look at examples of, 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 of people doing this, they say, okay, a gauge symmetry is, by definition, having a symplectic form that is uh, degenerate, but they never actually find the group G tilde. They have some physical input that they know from where they propose, oh, then probably the group G tilde is this one. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah. go ahead. Like, like you never derive that all of the of my uh, of your symplectic form were of the form integral d mu lambda d by d by a, a mu x, right? It was sort of, you had this physical input, which was that, oh, this, this is actually a connection on some principal bundle, and that is the correct field. And if I push it into space, then that's what happens. And this, for example, I feel is a problem, for example, in Chern Simons theory. Chern Simons theory is a, is a perfectly well behaved quantum field theory, which is in particular the feomorphism invariant, unlike Yang Mills, because, because Chern Simons theory doesn't depend on a metric, so it has a feomorphism invariants. But no one gauges that, the, that, that symmetry. And still people do quantum field theory with it. Like nobody gauges the diffeomorphism invariance. Everyone gauges the, 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 the d mu lambda invariance, but no one gauges the diffeomorphism. So yeah, I just. I, I, I just that's the thing that I also am not, that I'm also not, not sure about. I, I like to think of, I'm very tempted to think that gauge symmetries are something that are already encoded in the action. So when you gauge a theory, when you gauge a symmetry, you introduce something else. Right? So if you if you gauge, uh, I don't know, phase symmetry of a charge field, you need to introduce a gauge field that has also the, its kinetical terms and so on. Now, I'm sorry, I, 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 I misspoke. Of, I, but uh, I misspoke. I misspoke. Uh, uh, I mean, I shouldn't have said gauge. You're right. Like, I didn't mean to add a connection symmetry for the diffeomorphism symmetry in Schoen-Simons. What I meant is that when people do the path integral, they never consider equivalence classes under diffeomorphisms. So they consider the diffeomorphism symmetry uh, to the be a real symmetry. actual symmetry, not a gauge symmetry of the field. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I would, like, yeah. Also, if I remember I correctly, schoen Simons is special, right? Because actually that side, they know what's the gauge group, right? I'm sorry? If I'm not wrong, Chern Simon is also a special case, right? Because you, they actually know the gauge group, if I remember correctly, I'm not sure. I mean, like, they know it as well as they know it in Yamils, right? It's the same field. Uh, I mean, like, they know that the, I mean, they define like the gauge group, but, but it's not like the action has the knowledge of the gauge group. If you grab Chern Simon theory, part of the definition of Chern Simon theory is what the gauge group is. And that is, I believe, something very important physically, which is that I am, I am against the problem is that there are no straightforward examples, but I'm against saying that, that 
the action contains the information about the gauge symmetries because in actual examples, whenever you say that there is a gauge symmetry, you have a physical reason to do so. Like, in, like not, not from the action. You don't do a computation with the action. You say, because of this physically important data in my theory, I will consider the following to be a gauge symmetry. Um, yeah, but I think those are connected by what you consider to be the, the physical fields in your action that define the configuration. Uh, yeah, the field configurations that you consider, uh, the fields with respect to which you vary the Lagrangian, so to speak. I agree that that's like, and that's, in, and that's related to, to the construction that I gave here as well, because that's that, what you consider to be the dynamical fields is crucial in the way that you define the principal axial form and so on. I would say that this is encoding the information that you're claiming that there, there is some input from what you already expect to be a notion of gauge symmetry or theory. But I, at this point, this is this is a speculation. I don't know. Mario, I need to I need to leave for another meeting that I have at two, uh, so we have to cut this. Unfortunately, it was great though, Bruno. Fantastic. <laughs> <Yeah>. Finally, <laughs> at some point you have to tell us about about your paper, and also at some point we should discuss about uh, electromagnetism with boundaries and formulation, yeah. covariant formulation, electromagnetism with boundaries. Also, I think doing a, a phase-based formulation of uh, detector physics is easy. That not, that's not the difficult part. The difficult part is actually understanding well what it means to have a boundary, in a, a physical boundary in electromagnetism. Um, so anyway, yeah. we should discuss that yeah. at some point. As always, the detector is easy, the, the quantum field is hard. Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to stop the recording now.